Hi, I am going to discuss a brief overview of emulation techniques for older generation game consoles and some of the technical challenges related to those techniques. First, a brief overview of what emulation is and how it can be done. In the simplest terms, emulation is providing an environment for code compiled for a different, usually outdated or obsolete system, to run on a modern system. An example of this could be attempting to run an old DOS-based game on a modern Windows computer, or a more notable example of being able to play older console games, such as from the NES or SNES on a PC. In both of the aforementioned cases, the emulation method was from software. This method requires a program running on a modern system to read and execute compiled code, i.e. the game, by interpreting the instructions and manipulating a hardware model built-in software. The other main method for emulation is that of the hardware approach. A notable example of this would be in the Game Boy Advance, where the console had backwards compatibility with the Game Boy, which used a Z80 processor. The Game Boy Advance, however, used an ARM7 processor. So to solve the issue of backwards compatibility, the GBA CPU actually included a Z80 processor in hardware in addition to the ARM7 core. This method is not as common as software emulation, because it is often more expensive and harder to do. Software emulation, however, often requires many CPU cycles to do what hardware can do in a single cycle. Consider the case of the ADU instruction in MIPS, which is what the N64, PlayStation, and PlayStation 2 use. The ADU instruction is used to add two 32-bit unsigned integers together. On the left is some example C code which would execute this instruction. Here I decoded the instruction in line to save space. We begin by retrieving the first value to add, operand A, and then retrieve the second value to add, operand B. We then need to figure out what instruction is being executed and jump to that portion of the code, done here via a switch statement. Once we reach the code for the add U instruction, we add the two operands together and store them in the result variable. Then we exit the switch and store the result back into memory. Now let's add up the total operations this would require. Since the value retrieval requires a logical AND, a shift, and a memory load, they each take three operations. Likewise, storing the value back also takes three. Pulling the operation part out of the instruction takes one operation, and jumping to the add you part of the code will depend on the compiler, but let's say it takes around three operations, an add, a load, and a jump. Now, the adding takes one operation, since the CPU can add two numbers by itself, and leaving the switch statement takes another jump. Adding all that up, we have 15 operations. Note that I said operations and not cycles. This is because different operations can take different amounts of cycles. For simplicity, however, let's assume the CPU can do all operations in one cycle. Now let's look at a hardware implementation. Here, the instruction decoding is done in hardware all at once where the decoder tells the register file which values to pull out and where to store the result. Additionally, the decoder can tell the arithmetic logic unit to perform an add operation. All of this can be done in a single cycle. The catch is that the hardware solution's cycle frequency is going to be on the order of hundreds of megahertz, while the C code will run on a CPU which has a cycle frequency on the order of a couple gigahertz. However, if we assume the C code is running on an ARM CPU at 1.2 gigahertz, and the hardware example can operate at 160 MHz, then the hardware solution will be able to perform two add view operations in the time it takes the ARM CPU to simulate one. Obviously this is a crude example, but it should illustrate a benefit that hardware has over software. We should look at some of the pros and cons of both methods of emulation. For software, it is often cheaper, meaning that the only cost is having a computer which can run the software which most people have. It's often much easier to write a software emulator. Software emulators are more portable, meaning they can run on many different systems. However, they can be slower at runtime because the computer running it has extra work to do, such as interpreting the instructions and executing them. Additionally, software emulators can become very complicated in an effort to mitigate the slow runtime problem. For hardware emulators, they are often much faster than software emulators because they can directly implement the original hardware. They can be simpler, for example, in the case of the Game Boy Advance, putting a Z80 on the main chip was simpler than trying to program a Z80 emulator to run on the ARM core. They are, however, more expensive, requiring dedicated hardware. They can be much harder to implement, since hardware is harder to debug, and they require a dedicated target system and hardware.
This is why most emulation solutions are software based. Let's take a look at the game console generations and how their central processors compare. We can see that the processor speeds tend to increase non-linearly each generation, going from 1 to 4 to 8 to 100 to 800 megahertz up to 3.2 gigahertz. Interestingly, the drop in processor speed for the 8th generation consoles is as a result of increased number of processing cores. We can break the above table down into three main categories of emulation. Good software emulation candidates, bad candidates for emulation since the processors are too fast, and the sweet spot between the two being good candidates for hardware emulation. While software emulators for the N64 and PlayStation do exist, they have problems correctly reproducing the actual hardware behavior when it comes to timing and events. Finally, there is the original Xbox. While a clock frequency of 733 MHz is too fast to actually emulate on a reasonably priced FPGA, i.e. one that is not too expensive as of the year 2017, it could potentially be emulated at a lower frequency. Since the Xbox runs a version of the Windows 2000 kernel, most games probably use the OS system's timing events and therefore the game may not know the difference between 733 MHz and 620 MHz, where 620 MHz is more feasible for a modern, low-cost FPGA. Unfortunately though, it would be very difficult to emulate the Xbox since it uses an Intel Pentium 3 copper mine processor, which is a very complex out-of-order execution machine. Additionally, it has various other system components to worry about, all of which having little to no documentation available. For now, I will lump it into the too fast category. You may now be asking yourself, how exactly would one go about hardware emulating these consoles, and how did you draw the seemingly arbitrary line between too fast and good hardware emulation candidates? Well, the first part of the question is easy. Use a field programmable gate array, also known as an FPGA. These are devices which can be configured into any logic circuit the designer chooses, and can directly implement the logic used by the consoles. You can implement the slower consoles in the FPGA, which is what the MIST project is doing. However, the FPGA chosen by MIST is not sufficiently powerful enough to emulate most of the consoles on the hardware candidate list. You should still check out the MIST project though, since it has free models of classic Atari systems, the Commodore 64, the Apple II, and the NES, as well as many others. Now to answer the question on how I drew the boundary, let's take a look at a comparison of different commercially available FPGAs. I'm going to primarily look at Altera, which is now Intel FPGA, and Xilinx, since they are the two main brands, and I have the most experience with the two of them. Additionally, all of the FPGAs will be priced around or less than 100 US dollars, which will filter out things like high-end FPGAs, which cost several thousand dollars. Many of those FPGAs would actually be capable of emulating the Xbox and the Wii. However, you could probably just buy a used Xbox or Wii off of eBay for much less than that. I have compiled a table showing a few different options on the market as of 2017. The only reason I have included the Cyclone 3 is that that is what the MIST project uses. The clock speeds are taken from the faster models which still sit around 100 US dollars, with the exception of the Cyclone 10 GX which is around 135 US dollars. Note that these are one-off quantities which are closer to what the hobbyist would use. I have marked the Altera Max 10 as being flash based, which poses issues for a system like MIST, which allows for different internal configurations to emulate different hardware. As we all know, the downfall of flash memory is that it has a maximum number of writes before it fails. For this reason, the Max 10 is not a good candidate for any emulation solution, unless the emulation is not going to rapidly change. The other devices in the table can be programmed via a serial line, and therefore can switch their emulation hardware hundreds of thousands of times. I have included both the global clock frequency, which represents the fastest any implementation can clock at, as well as the RAM block clock, which is what a cache implementation would use. We can clearly see that most of the console CPUs are slower than the global clock for all of these devices, with the exception of the GameCube, which uses a PowerPC Gecko processor at 486 MHz. While designing an implementation that can reach this frequency is difficult, the bigger barrier is that of the RAM block clock, where all of these RAM blocks require two cycles to access. That means that the maximum speed of an implementation is effectively half of the maximum RAM block clock for L1 latencies of one cycle. With that said, let's compare the relevant processors and their L1 latencies. I am only going to consider the processors which could run into an issue with speed. I will ignore the PlayStation's R3000 processor as well as the Sega Saturn's Hitachi SH2 processor. From the previous table, we can see that all of the processors, with the exception of the Gecko, can be implemented in any of the Xilinx hardware 
or the Cyclone 10. If we include the Gecko, then the contenders are the Cyclone 10 and the Arctic 7, both of which can implement block RAM read speeds above 500 MHz. The only processor here which can be problematic is that of the PlayStation 2's R5900, which expects a one cycle read. However, since the time between the address calculation and expected data is 1.5 cycles, it is possible to use the opposite edge of the clock to make a two cycle read appear to be one cycle. As an aside, the original Xbox has an L1 read latency of three cycles, meaning that at a clock speed of 620 megahertz, the block RAM read speed on the Cyclone 10 and the Arctic 7 would be adequate. Another thing to take note of is the type of processors used. All of these processors are pipelined, which means that a single instruction takes multiple cycles to complete. However, multiple instructions are at different stages of completion at any given time. For example, while one is being executed, the next instruction is being decoded, and the one after that is being fetched from memory. The superscalar processors are also pipelined, with the exception that they have two pipelines, so that they can work on two instructions simultaneously. This is effectively just duplicate hardware and some complicated issue logic. The most interesting of the four here is the Gecko, which is an out-of-order execution processor, which is what most modern processors are, including AMD and Intel processors. These have multiple pipelines to work on multiple instructions at once, multiple here being more than two. The idea behind their execution is to effectively execute everything and sort out the order in the end. And if an instruction needs to be redone, so be it. Implementing such a design would be very difficult though, and is a topic for a whole series of videos which I'll probably never do. To give an example on how to implement a hardware emulator, let's take a look at how the MIST project implemented theirs. We can see that they used an ARM7 microcontroller to act as the controlling computer for the project. The program and RAM used by the ARM7 is internal to the AT91S chip. Additionally, the microcontroller is responsible for communicating with two joysticks which use a D9 connector. The microcontroller is then connected to the Cyclone 3 FPGA via an SPI bus, which is also shared with a USB to SPI converter and an SD card. The video is output directly from the FPGA via a resistor network to a VGA connector. When the system turns on, the microcontroller will program the FPGA allowing it to display a menu and load other hardware configurations, such as the Commodore 64 or SNES. Presumably any game ROMs would be provided via the SD card or the USB ports. While this configuration works, it's far from ideal, especially for more modern consoles such as the N64 and PS2. Additionally, it doesn't leave much room to allow users to play games off of legal media such as cartridges or discs. With that said, I will conclude with a more suitable hardware emulator idea. Here, a proposed implementation would use a fully embedded ARM processor with an on-chip GPU. This would allow for a full version of embedded Linux to run on the processor, have full USB connectivity for controllers, a SATA port for a hard drive or DVD drive, an Ethernet port to access the web, and a more standard HDMI output. The processor would communicate with the FPGA via a PCI bus, which would extend to an expansion slot, allowing for a cartridge reader to be attached so that legal game media can be played. The PCI bus has a significantly higher throughput than SPI and would be capable of offloading a 1080p frame buffer from the FPGA into the processor to be displayed over HDMI at a rate of around 80 frames per second. This would be done via an image or frame buffer DMA controller. Finally, a dedicated BIOS SRAM is added to the FPGA since it would allow implementations to easily boot and do a cold reset without having to load the BIOS over the PCI bus. I would like to conclude with the plans for how this series of videos will go. In this video I covered an overview of hardware emulation and some of its challenges, as well as which game consoles are prime candidates for hardware emulation. In the next video I will cover the general hardware architecture for the generation 5 and 6 game consoles. In the following video I will cover the specifics of the Nintendo 64 hardware architecture and how one might go about implementing the system in an FPGA. This will be followed by a more in-depth video covering the VR4300 CPU which is used by the N64. An interesting side note here is that the N64 and the PS1 and PS2 all use similar processors to the VR4300. This means that once a full VR4300 is implemented in an FPGA, the core design could be ported and integrated into a PS1 and a PS2 hardware emulation project. Thanks for watching.